This is the Happiness Quotient. I hope you'll take a moment to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, leave me a review, and rate the podcast. It's the best way, other than having you, my listeners, share with friends and on social media for people to learn about us and spread the good vibes and inspiration. Also, stay tuned at the end of this episode where I'll be introducing my new podcast, Because It's There. The HQ isn't going away. We're merely adding to the inspiration twofold with this awesome new podcast. Happiness Jones. I want to give you a quick update before I introduce you to our guest for today's episode, the one and only Jamie McGinnis, six-time Everest climber from New Zealand, who has been a Sherpa, and he led our team on Everest in 2019. Today, he's going to tell us about one of the most notorious and tragic stories in recent Everest history, the David Sharp story. On May 14th, 2021, in episode 80, I interviewed my longtime friend of many mountain adventures, Andy Politz. Andy and I had another conversation upon his return from Everest, where at age 61, 30 years since his first climb of the mountain, Andy made his second ascent of the mountain, this time from the south. 30 years between successful summits and tagging at age 61 is no small feat. I spoke with a healthy, happy, and reflective Andy from his hotel in Kathmandu, where he debriefed me on his successful climb. It was an amazing interview, and moments before I made the episode go live, we had to pull the episode for reasons I can't go into here. It's a very unfortunate thing that we're unable to share that interview at this time, as Andy's words are beyond inspirational. I'm leaving it there as a placeholder for episode number 82, and we are gonna move right on to episode 83 with Jamie McGinnis. I've agreed with Andy that upon his return to the States, which will be very soon, We'll do an episode together where he's going to talk about his inspiring story, which has made a lasting impression on thousands of high school students over the years to whom he's given presentations and courses. Today, I bring you an amazing story of Mount Everest with six-time summiter and the climbing leader of our 2019 expedition to search for the body of Sandy Irvin, Jamie McGinnis. The original intent of this interview with Jamie was to talk about the expedition of ours in 2019, which has since become a National Geographic film called Lost on Everest and is the subject of a book by New York Times best-selling author Mark Sinnott called The Third Pole, Mystery, Obsession, and Death on Mount Everest, which we did talk about But in starting our interview, I asked Jamie about what it was like working as a Sherpa, literally as a Sherpa, on expeditions back in the day. And the Sherpa, the actual culture, the tribe of Sherpa who live in Nepal in the Khumbu region, are incredibly strong, almost superhuman, adapted over centuries of living at high altitude, and they become stronger and faster while working at altitude and therefore have become invaluable on Everest expeditions over the years. Jamie literally joined their ranks. He worked as a Sherpa on several expeditions, which is a superhuman feat. That's saying something. And I even people who might want to or fancy doing the work of a Sherpa have no business even trying it. Jamie is really a, a unique individual, one of the strongest people I've ever climbed with. In explaining what it was like to be a Sherpa, Jamie also began telling me about the story of David Sharp, the English mountaineer who died near the summit of Mount Everest in 2006. His death caused 
international controversy and debate because he was passed by a number of other climbers heading to and who were returning from the summit as he was dying. Although a number of others did try to help him, Jamie had worked with David in previous years and knew him very well, and he gives an incredibly full and detailed breakdown of one of the most tragic stories in recent history on Everest, and I think that you're truly going to enjoy that story. In it, he also shares about the story of Lincoln Hall, an Australian climber who during that same year where David Sharp lost his life, Lincoln Hall was reported to have died and then miraculously survived. Jamie was on the front line of that story and he shares about that here as well. This is here on the Happiness Quotient. We have him, Jamie McGinnis. Here's my May 2nd, 2021 conversation with one of the strongest climbers from New Zealand since Sir Edmund Hillary. It would be really cool if you could tell me a little bit, if we could roll the clock back on you, you have climbed Everest six times, but you've been there m- multiple times, including in the role of Sherpa, which is, believe me, man, that is, that to me, you might as well climb Everest without oxygen in a t-shirt before becoming a Sherpa and not be a real Sherpa, because that is the hardest job on the planet, damn dangerous too. I'd love it if you just kind of told me a little bit about that and and what that experience was like. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, how how this sort of, I fell into this also. Um, so it was an expedition to Choi Yu, which is the sixth highest mountain. Um, and there was a team there who uh, had a lot of problems. Um, we were there with the group that was fine uh, with an expedition it was all going well um but they just ran into endless problems and as it happens it was david sharp on the team um essentially what they'd done is to save money they'd said to the trekking company give us all the supplies at base camp and we'll cook ourselves <laughs> and when they got there and realized that they had rice flour and they didn't know what to do with it Um, I sorted out uh, a cook from another expedition who would cook first for his expedition, then come over and do it. Anyway, um, as it happened, one of the team members died on the expedition. That was very sad. Um, I ended up carrying the body off with um, another uh, climbing Sherpa. Um, And uh, Mm. when they said they were going to Everest the next year, I was like, oh, they were disorganized and just, you know, nice people, but, you know, the the leader just didn't have it together. So I said, okay, so how about, you know, I go as a climbing Sherpa, will that work? Because they didn't want a guided trip, you know, I was sort of guiding 8,000 meter peaks. And they said, okay. Um, And they booked very last minute, there were all sorts of issues. We ended up with one climbing Sherpa who was the bottom of the barrel, basically, um, and myself. And, but what was really interesting, (laughs) so, you know, on the mountain, so climbing, you know, carrying the loads is real. And this is where I'm so lucky because actually I, I, you know, felt fit enough, strong enough. I could see that they were eating mountains of dal bat. I needed to, you know, they could eat once or uh, twice a day. I needed to eat three or four times a day. I needed snacks, but otherwise I could do it. But what I realized was these guys, the, um, the, Sirdar's the the boss climbing Sherpas, if you will, Uh, a lot of them are really exceptional people, Um, not just in terms of organization, they have that, but in terms of fitness and in terms of just joviality and just attitude getting things done. You know, it was, I had a lot of fun, um, you know, and the hard work didn't seem too hard to me, to be honest, you know, I just, I pushed my body and I could, but um, there's uh, one guy at Siring Dorji who, um, you know the name because he's the he's the person who actually saw Sandy Irvine's body on the mountain. So um, I remember one time I was I was uh, 
climbing towards North Col, and there was Siring Dorji. And so he's a chatty guy. He's, he likes to joke and he's very forward in your face with a lot of things. And I looked at his load and his load was just small. You know, it looked like it was a few oxygen cylinders and that was about it. And as it happened, I had a really big pack because I had some oxygen cylinders, a little bit of heavy stuff in there, but I had a lot of down gear. So, you know, there was this huge pack. And um, I said to him, swap. And uh, he said, okay. <laughs> and I lifted his pack and I'm like, what the hell have you got in here? And I did swap, I did carry it up, but his pack was, was substantially heavier than mine. And um, what I found out later, he didn't tell me, he wouldn't tell me, but he had um, a bronze statue in there that he took to the top of Everest put there that had a glass case over it and um, it you know it weighed I don't know 10 or 12 kilos or something like that and he climbed Everest three times that season to get the record for the number of times in a season um, working for an Indian uh, military team and um, on the third time left the statue up on top of Everest this bust I guess this Buddha sort of um, uh, bust which was so so cool um, but um, it was uh, the whole experience was very enlightening for me because the joking, kidding around, the camaraderie. You know, in the Western teams, people are friendly, but they're competing on a business level as well. Um, and you know, having friends really helps. And but at the same time, there's that little bit. The climbing Sherpas know that they're going to be working with their friends next year on another expedition, perhaps together. Mm -hmm. So. Among many of them in the, in a sort of a, a group that you could say really know each other and trust each other, they really, they, they just help out. They're just really friendly and good. So it was a great experience to really, um, mm. to work closely with them. And then later how this, how this worked out was, so at that time, the Climbing Sherpas, basically Russell Bryce was the mayor of base camp, as you've kind of heard on the north side this was. And they were like, and the climbing Sherpas were like, well, we need somebody to go and collect all the money uh, and then distribute it among the climbing Sherpas, the additional work that's done on the mountain that's done on behalf of teams mm -hmm. rather than the individual uh, expeditions, you know, on behalf of all the teams, like fixing the rope higher up. And it's a tricky job because you can get accused of all sorts of things. So they looked at me and they pointed at me. And um, so <laughs> it was my job to go around to each expedition leader and team and explain that they should be paying for this and to collect the money. And what I wanted to make sure of was every cent, every, every rupee went to the right place. And so um, uh, I always... Uh, took along a couple of other people with me and you know, we just kept a clear account, just a handwritten account. But um, I could see that you know, in, that, in that aspect, the trust of being able to show everything, being able to speak clearly about it really mattered. And so this is why to me, you know, this is this trust aspect, this respect aspect is, is so important. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we didn't start out with um, a lot of it. We had some of it with some of the people working with us, but some of the new crew and the outside crew, it was very hard to get that. And I just, there was a lot going on. We were busy. We were having fun, but we were busy all the time. Yeah. Um, so it was harder to gel. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Very, very awesome story. And I could probably go in about 10 different directions right now. Um, however, I, I would like to ask you ever so briefly about David Sharp, if you're comfortable talking about it, because he, be, you know, he became world news the next year and you were at least in proximity as that took place. Can, can you, are you willing to, would you be interested in, okay, with kind of explaining what happened there? David Sharp, um, Oh, David Sharp, this is this is a tale because you know it hit world headlines. But um, you have to understand the real sort of David Sharp. He uh, he was a teacher. Uh, he ended up working as a um, on some sort of government projects involved with um, AI, basically in mm -hmm. the early days with uh, missiles. Um, he was smart. You know, he was wow. articulate. Um, he was very English in a lot of ways. He was sort of um, skinny, lean, thoughtful, um, respectful, um, not at all brash or anything like that. So mm -hmm. I met him, we climbed um, Choyu together, 
Um, that was the time when I mentioned about um, this other expedition, uh, the Irish one, the Northern Ireland one, that had problems. So David was with me, the Northern Ireland expedition was separate. And um, we got to the um, top of Choi Yu, and it was all looking good, and we just sat in the snow, and wow, um, just looked across at Everest, because you look from the top of Choi Yu, from the real top, you look straight across at Everest, and it's about the only thing that's higher than you, because you're on the sixth highest mountain of the planet. You know, even 7,000 meter mountains, when you're up there, just look like nothing anymore. They're just, you know, on the way up, they, they're big and then all of a sudden you look down, they're just, they're not there almost. Mm. So anyway, we climbed it and then um, the next expedition he was involved with was this Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland expedition to Everest. He um, joined the expedition basically to make it work, you know, more financially, there were only three of them anyway. Mm. Um, so we were on expedition together there. I was working as the climbing Sherpa um, along with uh, Ang Puri. And um, we moved uh, all the oxygen, everything up. It was an interesting summit window because this was the sort of early-ish days of Explorers Web with Tom and Tina running things. And they had a free weather forecast up on the website that you could access. And this was gold mm -hmm. uh, because they were generating forecasts through whoever, you know, up to about 10 days out. Um, so you could see this weather window. So we watched this weather window. I looked at it and the weather window looked fairly clear in the beginning. It, it was late in the season. Everybody was itching to go. And um, basically, the closer the weather window got, the worse the weather looked and it kind of disappeared. But nobody had any more time left on the expedition, basically on any of the expeditions. And so basically everybody had to go anyway. So. Um, I carried the last load up to Camp 3. Ang Puri had uh, stolen some oxygen bottles and left for Kathmandu by that stage, so which was quite bizarre and uh, not, not usual for uh, most of the climbing Sherpas, that sort of thing. Yeah. But um, so uh, Richard and David Sharp went to, tried to go to the summit of Everest. They were wearing um, the old style Scarpa plastic boots, not the, not the new sort of Mie um, that are fully insulated and uh, that have really thick insulation. So they turned back, came back down. You know, there was carnage on the mountain. The weather got slightly better during the day, but if it had got slightly worse, there could have been 30 or 40 dead. Uh, instead, there were just uh, a lot of emergencies. Um, and uh, yeah, it was one of those days. In fact, it was one of those nights because we'll, we'll roll back a bit just for a little story, sorry. So I'm carrying the last load up. And um, I get up to um, the camp three, the highest camp at 8,200 meters or so, camp six, as we talk in, uh, in 1920 terms. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, no, there's no place to put the tent. So I start digging out a tent platform and it's a horrible place. It's steep there, a little bit too steep really for any sort of comfort. And so I'm trying to scrape stuff out and I've been there for an hour and I sort of get the tent up a little bit, but it's a small tent, it's not looking great. Mm -hmm. And um, David and Richard turn up and I say, okay, I'm out of here. And they say, no, hang on, help us with the tent or you put up the tent so that we don't ruin our summit chances. So I spend another five hours hacking out the tent platform. And by oh. this time, um, so I've come up wearing a down suit. I had um, a power bar or something like that in my pocket. I had a little one of those Nalgene half liter um, or 450 mil bottles. Yeah. Um, yeah, the dinky little ones in my pocket. And that's all I had because I was just dropping a load up there and then I was going to go back down to the next camp, to the Ooh. lower camp. So uh, night, you know, basically it was sort of 5.30 at night by the time I finished this. So um, uh I borrowed a mat from somebody and uh, a thin foam mat and uh, they had a sleeping bag each and they said, oh, they only needed one sleeping bag in the small tent. So I went and slept outside at uh, that night, but the wind was howling <laughs> and I was in this um, sleeping bag that was just, uh, it wasn't quite big enough for me to put, keep my boots on and, uh, and uh, in the sleeping bag. So I had to take my boots off. So I slept outside. That's, you know, I couldn't find, uh, 
I had a bottle of oxygen stashed somewhere else, couldn't find it. Um, so I slept outside without oxygen. And every 20 minutes, half an hour, I had to sort of hold my toes because the wind was pressing on the sleeping bag of my feet. And so there was no insulation there. So uh, I, was, I was worried about losing my toes. And, but the funny thing is, so um, the place I'd chosen uh, in the dark, more or less, um, and I hadn't been up there before, um, or maybe I'd been up once. Anyway, um, the first expedition going to the summit set off, and um, Carrie Kobler, who's a well-known Swiss guide, looked over and said, oh, wow, that's the first dead body. And I said, actually, no, it's not. It's me. I'm alive. It's Jamie. And he knew who I was at that stage. And he just laughed and just uh, was quite surprised. <laughs> but worse than that was uh, Richard and um, uh, David Sharp walked past. And they also said, oh, man, that's a dead body. What can we do? And they didn't recognize that it was their climbing Sherpa in their sleeping bag. That's how messed up you are at altitude, yeah? Um, so anyway, I managed to get um, uh, back down, find some oxygen, warm my feet up, basically, because the oxygen really helps with the circulation. And I headed back down. They uh, back down to the next camp. They tried to go for the summit. Their boots weren't warm enough and they had a little bit of frostbite on their fingers and their toes and their cheeks, they turned back. And uh, so um, I met them and I went down to base camp with them, uh, to ABC, sorry, Advanced Base Camp, dealt with it. And then actually I went all the way down to base camp as they then left the expedition, you know, left early, well, not early, but just went back to uh, Kathmandu, returned to Kathmandu. And then I climbed back up and then because Banjo, the uh, the last guy on the Northern Ireland expedition, didn't want to be seen guided as such, you know, I wasn't a guide, I was a climbing Sherpa, we did go up to Camp 3 together. Um, it was hilarious because uh, he was such a funny guy, such a nice guy. We'd had some other crazy things happen in base camp. Um, he ended up marrying the woman, which is quite surprising, a base camp flunky that flew, uh, that came around. Um, we were we were sitting in the dining tent and this uh, this group of three or four tourists came in and said, wow, are you on, on an Everest expedition? And like, yep, we are. Or I wasn't there, but they did and um, invited them in. And in the end, they uh, they ended up staying up there for the night. <laughs> and and uh, the, show, the climbing Sherpas and another team weren't too happy about sort of the noise and everything that might have gone on. Yeah. But he ended up marrying Lauren, um, which is quite amazing, Banjo. Anyway, we uh, he couldn't, he, for some reason, he was struggling at altitude. And he just couldn't, and he was a strong guy, funny as hell, but he just couldn't get his, uh, couldn't quite get up to the camps with uh, the stuff that he was carrying. So on basically every time he'd gone to a camp, I had to climb, he'd radio, I would climb down and then bring his stuff up um, the last 100, 200 meters. Mm -hmm. And um, not my place to say it, but coming up to camp three, um, he'd called down, radioed down and said, oh, can you come and help me that last bit, which is quite tough actually, that last bit into camp three, uh, the highest camp. and. Um, I sort of said, ah, oh, if you can't get up here, perhaps you, know, you shouldn't be going to the summit. It might be too dangerous. Bad, you know, bad climbing Sherpa discussion there. But um, he did get up to the camp. I did bring the, the last bit in. And um, when we went to the summit, we went separately, you know, because I was basically going as a, you know, we were for ourselves in this case. Yeah. And um, after a couple of hours, I looked looked back, I didn't see any head torch, I kept going, I got to the summit. Um, there was uh, one of Russell Bryce's expedition on top, and I took photos of them. And then uh, I asked, it was Sue Fear, who's an Australian climber. And I asked her to take photos of me. And she said no, because she'd get frostbite on her hands handling the camera. I was like, Oh, so I took a couple of selfies with the days of film. And uh, what I never realized was, I got those photos back and I had blood running down from my nose. Nobody had told me I had blood running down my face. <laughs> I didn't taste it. Um, and that's when I realized that you know, I'd climbed with oxygen. Um, but when you're on there, when you're on the summit, when you're looking around with oxygen, you're just going to see better, you're going to feel better, you're going to experience more of it. Anyway, um, 
So I went back really with Richard and with David to base camp and um, then they took a Jeep out. Then I'd come up to climb um, with Banjo. And what I'd missed out on was if I hadn't taken them back, actually, I could have been a climbing, working climbing Sherpa from New Zealand, climbing Everest on the, uh, what's it, the 50th or 60th anniversary of, um, of Hillary's climb. And uh, instead, I missed that by a couple of days because I'd taken them down. I think uh, life could have been a slightly different trajectory if I'd exploited that. Um, not that I feel comfortable exploiting something like that, but it was pretty cool to be up there anyway and climb as a work, truly as a climbing Sherpa, truly carrying the loads, truly working, you know, spending a lot of time talking with these guys, understanding how it is. And, you know, for a lot of people, you know, it sounds like an impossible job, um, you know, that they can work so much harder than most foreigners, but they're genetically adapted. That's not all of it, but um, they're definitely genetically adapted um, mm. to altitude and have a physiology. And also, you know, in being brought up, have had um, just sort of less food, less surety of food. Their bodies are better with energy and all sorts of things. And that's uh, that's you know basically their advantage. Um, let's get back to David Sharp now, though. Mm. So that was David Sharp's first time on Everest. 2004. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I need to pull up my lists. And then uh, he went back again. And then the third time, basically, um, I guess it's the third time anyway. I remember um, I contacted him. Oh, actually, I sat with him in Sam's bar. Um, now, I don't know how this came about, but I said to him that um, he had had bad experiences on both of those expeditions. And I said, I said to him, point blank, you know, join our expedition, pay whatever you're going to pay Asian trekking or, you know, which was something like $10,000 at the time, we were charging 20,000 to climb. I said, just pay them the, the only constraint is, you know, when we go for the summit, we've got to have everything in place. We've got to have all the oxygen ready. We've got to have the climbing Sherpas with us. We've got to have this backup if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, wow, that's a, an, a generous offer. Um, and said that you know, I just won't do that because of those constraints. You know, they're good constraints, I understand, but he wanted to climb Everest without oxygen, uh, you know, additional bottled oxygen, and um, realized that you know, he needed uh, some freedom rather than having that full setup, that full backup. Um, so uh, he was with his expedition. He came over. We had dinner in base camp. You know, he came over for lunch, dinner, just chats. It's it's social. It's fun in base camp. He spent a bit of time at our camp. I, I always, I, I said a few times to him, you know, just take a radio from us. Yeah, one of our radios that I'd um, set up to um, work on the frequency so that we'd be in contact. And that's my lasting regret with uh, David was that he didn't take a radio. If I pushed him a little bit harder, maybe he would have. But um, so David Sharp, he went for the summit. Um, we weren't there. We were at uh, advanced base camp. Um, there were a few other teams around, but um, he was climbing essentially by himself. He wanted to climb in a pure style um, without oxygen. But the issue when you're climbing without oxygen, without bottled oxygen is what do you do in an emergency? So what quite a few of the climbers now do is have a climbing Sherpa walking behind who carries the oxygen for you, just in case. He carried a, a bottle of oxygen himself and regulator and mask, and that adds five kilos or so, you know, 10, 12 pounds. And um, so he didn't summit until perhaps 4 p.m. It's not truly known whether he summited. I think he did. Um, there was the first Bhutanese climber who we talked with a bit. Um, but they came back and something happened on the way back between them or they split, you know, they couldn't keep up something. But anyway, David just stopped there. You know, in, in some of our other discussions, we'd talked a bit about the history of Everest, about how uh, Doug Scott, who's uh, um, you know, very English, um, uh, slept out a night on, uh, on Everest, you know, bivouacked um, when he got caught out. And 
I'd said to David that, you know, from my experience on the mountains, the thing that you wanted the most was some sort of sleeping pad or sitting pad to sleep on. And then if the weather was okay, you know, you'd, it'd be probably pretty tough. We discussed it, and, and but it would be survivable. But, and so he had this in his mind that, you know, um, you could do this. And so when he was so late, um, he must have gotten to where Green Boots was, you know, in the dark, basically, and decided that was the place with the, you know, with a little bit of shelter where he could sort of shelter for the night. But um, I don't think he had a pad to sit on. He might have, he might not have. But whatever it was, it was such a savagely cold night. Um, it was a really cold, um, slightly windy night. You know, even a bit more than a gentle breeze on Everest, you know, when the wind when the air temperature is minus 30 or 40, it just cuts through everything. Um, now, that night that he's there, lying there, sitting there, basically sitting hunched over, um, a number of expeditions went past, most famously uh, Russell Bryce's uh, team with Mark Ingalls, who's an Australian climber who was an amputee. Uh, he'd lost both legs, um, a climbing accident in Mount Cook. Um, uh, quite a famous one in New Zealand, and um, you know, with Mark Fetu and some of the guides, and so there's a little bit of video of him there. The other team that went past was um, the Turkish team, and there was a you know a big Turkish team. Basically, I don't know if they'd be the first Turks to summit, but it was a big team. They really wanted to do it. They weren't experienced um, on the 8,000 meter mountains um, up there. Anyway, so uh, I I had dinner with the Turkish team afterwards. And they just walked past and they just said to him, don't, don't sit down for too long, keep going, keep going. They thought he was moving up. And to me, that seemed genuine when I spoke with them. Um, things were a lot more roundabout in uh, Russell's camp about this. Um, I'm not saying Russell did anything wrong, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's tricky when you're up there. Anyway, so David Sharp somehow um, just stayed there, didn't get the help until later. The next, uh, you know, when these when these climbers were coming back down from the summit, and um, we were going up now, and uh, I met Dawa, who works for Aaron Trex, who was working with the Turkish team. Um, he was the sort of lead climbing sherpa, if you like, for them, um, and the brother of the boss of Aaron Trex. And I met him on the snow slope. Uh, going up between uh, North Col and uh, Camp Camp 2, you know, that big, long snow slope that's, uh, that's featureless almost, just with a rope. And we sat down in the snow and he cried. He just, he cried. He said he had tried to help David Sharp. You know, everybody knew about there was something up with David. There wasn't a lot of communication going on. But he said, you know, him and uh, one of the uh, climbing Sherpas from Russell's team, which I think was Perbatashi, had spent at least half an hour with him trying to help him stand up. He was uh, slurring, he couldn't speak. Um, and uh, Dawa said that he could see, I don't know how he knew it was sort of frostbite unless it was blackening, but that the blackening was halfway up his uh, forearms um, and uh, he couldn't really move his legs. His legs wouldn't support his weight. And to get any further down, you know, that's what was needed if he could just stand up, but he just couldn't stand up. And he was in tears as he relayed this to me because he knew he was leaving him to, you know, to die. Um, what is amazing, um, and I've discussed this with David also earlier, sadly, um, you know, much earlier, was that people sort of, when they're dying of, of cold, you can come alive again like Beck Weathers did um, in 1996 on Everest, you suddenly sort of woke up and realized this was his last chance and somehow this energy came back in. And I think this is what happened with David Sharp as well was not the energy, but just the life because he should have died uh, it, you know, later that night, um, early morning when it was cold as hell. And I think your body or just your heart rate just drops so low, you know, um, all the blood stops going to the extremities. That's where the frostbite comes from. And um, you're almost in a hibernation until you kind of die. And um, you know, anyway, so I guess the real controversy with David Sharp was the fact that, and it spread around the world like wildfire, that he'd been left for dead. Um, and you know, 
oh, it's heartbreaking in many ways. You know, people could have helped him and uh, it, you know, it might have turned out differently if he was helped instead uh, intensively at um, when people went past him at sort of one, two in the morning, three in the morning, yeah, two in the morning. Um, and it might have also been impossible to rescue him. Whatever it is, David, we discussed, he didn't want to endanger rescuers at all. Uh, a lot of people think like this, at least until the shit hits the fan anyway. But, you know, we'd had that discussion and he really, he didn't, uh, and I know that also from what he said, you know, to be a sentinel, to be a, a body there, to sort of remind people that they should take care of themselves up there also on the way down. I'm not sure that he would have minded that role too much, although I can quite see his mother uh, and family didn't want that at all. Um, you know, and uh, um, yeah, but um, the controversy was, so he was left for dead. Then um, Lincoln Hall, who, um, that's a curious story as well. We'll just give a little bit of background there. Lincoln Hall's climbing with an Australian geographic team of uh, four climbers. Um, and uh, one of them's aiming to be the youngest to climb, uh, the son and uh, the father. And um, basically, uh, early on in the expedition, the son who's 15 years old, we could see the father was a pushy sort of driving sort, um, unlike uh, with Jordan Romero, um, mm -hmm. who became the youngest mm -hmm. American. His father was, wow, he was a good guy and uh, gentle and philosophical. But um, so uh, this was, uh, this kid was being pushed. And um, so at uh, advanced base camp, you have 6,400 meters, 21,000 feet, he walks out of camp to go to North Col, gets up, uh, I don't know, 150 meters and faints. And um, so they pick him up, they help him, they get him down to advanced base camp, sorry. And uh, the doctor looks him over, they go to base camp, um, you know, comes back up, doctor, the Russian doctor looks him over carefully, says, well, he couldn't see anything wrong, you know, didn't know what it was, you know, what did they want to do? Well, they want to try again. So the kid gets to the same spot and faints. And, you know, exactly the same spot and, you know, explain that, that's the time when you give up, you, you know, you, he shouldn't have been there in the first place. Anyway, the point is Lincoln Hall now is on this expedition that had four, four or five members, and he's the only one left. All the others have to go back. Yeah. So uh, Lincoln has a lot of support. And Lincoln Hall, you might remember, um, was part of the White Limbo team that um, climbed straight up the North Face, the Australian team that climbed straight up, which was yeah. such a cool expedition, a crazy expedition, Tim McCartney Snape. Mm -hmm. They, um, I forget, they lost their boots or something, or their boots got wet. They had to climb in um, ski boots, touring ski boots um, as well. And Lincoln was in support. Lincoln didn't summit with them. So this was you know, many, many years later, this was Lincoln's chance to summit. He went up and um, his team was being supported by um, Alex Abramov, um, Seven Summits, um, uh, who's an interesting guy, very Russian, very practical, very straight. Um, and uh, I really, I get on well with Alex. He's, uh, he's good. Um, that year I had my radio tuned so that I could listen into every expedition. It would just scan all the frequencies. We'd noted them all down at base camp. And um, I realized that Lincoln was in trouble. So we listened in on this, the, you know, the whole day, basically. And I went to chat with Alex and there was a lot happening in his camp. And um, uh, so um, the climbing Sherpas were speaking a mixture of Nepali and Sherpa. I don't speak Sherpa, my Nepali is limited, but they use pretty limited languages, uh, language themselves. And so I could understand everything they were saying and a few words crept out. And um, as, oh, and we had a team up there. We were actually, I was running two expeditions. One was Scott Willems, um, who had 12 clients, and then I was running the Everest Peace Project. Um, and uh, so we had, you know, Scott was up there. This was why I was watching everything so carefully. And Scott and the team were coming down and Oh, a climber. Oh, well, yeah, that's even another story. We can't go there. A climber <laughs> fell dead right in front of them. Anyway, so I'm listening in on all this and um, 
at about 7 p.m. that night, the climbing Sherpas are, are saying, OK, tell this to our wives when we don't get back. And I just jumped in. I thought about it and I just jumped in and I said, well, what's his condition? They said he's, you know, a sack of potatoes, basically. Um, I said, well, you know, shine a, eye, uh, shine a torch in his eyes. They said nothing happened. Um, uh, I don't know whether they were looking for flickering or pupil dilation. I mean, I hadn't told them that. Um, my Nepali wasn't to that ability, but they said nothing happened. And I said, you guys have to go. So it was actually me that told them to keep going down, yeah, to, to abandon Lincoln Hall. It was either going to be um, three people dead or one person dead, as far as I could see. And I went and uh, I, so I gave this without Alex being there. We'd been at his camp. We've discussed all sorts of problems during the day. Um, I went back over to Alex's camp and he said, yeah, that's the way it had to be. And um, he put an announcement out that Lincoln Hall was dead immediately. Um, that's the Russian in him. It's like, yeah. And, um, you know, and as far as we were concerned, he was dead. And then um, Phil Crampton climbing with uh, Dan Mazur as a guide, um, uh, they had uh, oxygen problems. Phil was actually climbing without oxygen. Dan had one bottle, I think, um, or something like this. Uh, they they ran into Lincoln Hall, and he just uh, he sort of sat up and uh, he had didn't have his gloves on. He had his down suit open in the sun, I think it was even. Um, mightn't have been in the sun, but um, he just said, "Oh, I bet you're surprised to see me here." And they were, <laughs> and so that was a a great excuse for them to basically to help him, or at least spread the word and turn around from their summit attempt, which uh, was from a logistical point of view looking pretty dodgy. Um, I guess I've said a bit much detail. Actually, I'm not sure Dan will be too happy with that description, but that's what was happening. Um, and uh, but the problem was they had toy radios as well and uh, couldn't radio down to uh, advance base camp. So um, uh, the message was relayed through um, in the end, uh, oh, some climbing Sherpas anyway. And um, so Lincoln Hall was uh, so then Alex had 13 climbing Sherpas climbing up to um, the highest camp to clear it, bring down, and then um, they were diverted. Um, well, had to climb higher, some of them, and pick up uh, Lincoln Hall and bring him down. And so Lincoln lived and David Sharp died in these same sort of circumstances, um, you know, basically being left for dead. And um, the, the big, big difference was with David Sharp, it was a frigid, freezing, icy cold night. And with Lincoln Hall, it's never warm up there, but it wasn't too bad, you know, it it might have been just a little bit below um, zero Celsius, might have been minus five, minus 10, but it was still completely still. And that's where you know, if you have a bit of energy in your body and a little bit of oxygen too, that'll help you, you know, burn that energy uh, while you're breathing, keep you warm, you're not pushing your body too much, you can survive. And so that was the real controversy of the season was, you know, was Lincoln Hall surviving. But the, the crazy thing was, of course, Lincoln had been declared dead. And um, a friend of mine, Duncan Chessel, spoke, tried to speak with the family to tell them that um, actually he wasn't dead. Um, and they had a family member protecting them um, who wouldn't let Duncan speak with them. And in the end, Duncan just said, what do you need? And um, they said, we need a photo. He said, we need a photo. So I took a photo of uh, Lincoln in the tent. Um, he's smiling actually with his hands bandaged and uh, sent that, um, it was low quality, but uh, sent that and uh, that photo got out and basically went around the world. And that was the thing that eventually proved that to the family that re he really was alive. Um, but um, definitely uh, Lincoln was a smart cookie, interesting, interested person. And that experience somehow dulled his brain a bit. Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, that was the reality of it. And very sadly, later he died of a disease I can't pronounce, but basically from experience, um, clearing out asbestos from a, uh, a local, local school. school. Mesothelioma, um, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> yeah. So that's David Sharp and Lincoln Hall and the contrasts. And uh, 
you know, there, there are a few more tales um, from that, uh, that day on Everest as well. But uh, as you can see, I mean, it's an experience up there sometimes, uh, mm -hmm. a crazy, crazy experience. And we kind of had that too. I'll be sharing another part of my interview with Jamie here on the HQ in a week. And then also more about the Mallory and Irvin mystery in my new podcast, which I want to tell you about now. It's called Because It's There. Here's the teaser. The true definition of adventure is an endeavor you embark upon when you don't know the outcome. In the spirit of long-lost Everest pioneer George Mallory, who was told that no human being could ever climb Mount Everest, we tip our caps here to the people who dared to go where few others dared. Mallory was once asked, why climb Everest? He's famously credited to have answered, because it's there. We all have an Everest, whether on land, sea, air, space, or quite simply, the mind. In Because It's There, we'll be meeting with some of the world's most intrepid explorers and adventurers, scientists, biologists, oceanographers like Don Walsh, who in 1960 co-piloted the Bathyscaphe Trieste to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, 35,994 feet below the sea. We'll share a rare interview with Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man to ever set foot upon the summit of Everest. We'll also meet modern day explorers like climber, filmmaker, social media influencer, Renan Ozturk. We'll investigate mysteries such as the disappearance of George Mallory and Sandy Irvin, who in 1924 disappeared high upon the slopes of Everest, last seen at over 28,000 feet going for the top. Their disappearance continues to captivate armchair mountaineers and would-be sleuths almost a hundred years later. What these men and women all share is a belief in oneself, the refusal to accept the common idea that something is impossible. Because It's There will amaze you, educate, entertain, and inspire listeners to stretch the limits of their imagination and begin to see what's possible. If you ever thought about what it would be like to sail around the world in an ancient styled ship made of reeds, swim the English Channel, search for never before discovered species, climb Mount Everest, balloon around the globe. Well, because it's there, we'll share important and unique contributions to exploration, science, literature, adventure, and human endeavor throughout history and into the future. I'm your host, explorer, adventurer, and filmmaker, Tom Pollard. I've been all around this great big world, and I look forward to sharing this exciting podcast with you because it's there. Thank you to the Wood Brothers and their management for the use of their song, Happiness Jones, for our theme song here on the HQ, and to their publicist, Kevin Calabro, for helping make it all happen. Hmm. I'm wondering if there's a Wood Brothers song that would fit for Because It's There, or maybe it hasn't been written yet. Oh, perhaps we will share some inspiration back in that direction, since we derive so much from that amazing song and their incredible talents. Thank you, Wood Brothers. I got a happiness if you'd like a free downloadable PDF of the Happiness Quotients, A Course in Happiness, visit me at patreon.com slash the happiness quotient. And for more information about me, to inquire about personal coaching or public speaking, in person or virtually, 
please visit eyesopenproductions.com or write me anytime at tom.dharma.pollard at gmail. Remember, that which we most want to find can often be discovered in the place where we least want to look. And the deeper and darker the well, the brighter the light we will discover. Don't curse the dark cloud. The rain inside may very well turn your garden green. Thank you for visiting the Happiness Quotient. I will see you all real soon. Happiness just